those of you who know me know that I normally talk simply from notes and I wander around. Uh, however, uh, <coughs> Corny told me he wants 170 years of history in 60 minutes. <laughs> <coughs> I'd get to Riken and we, 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 an hour later we'd be on point one. Uh, so what I've done this morning is I've, I've prepared a text. Uh, you don't have to take notes because I'm going to give you the text when uh, I'm done. And I'm also going to give you uh, a packet of background reading uh, to uh, give you more to read about what I'm going to say. <clears throat> I've decided to take the approach of looking at the history of the Zverian brothers through personalities. Uh, among the older brothers, the what I call the legends, you've heard about them, but they're long gone in the past. Some of you may know some of the brothers that I talk about as I get uh, more towards uh, the future, uh, future, excuse me, towards the present. Uh, <clears throat> as Corny says, I, I'm in process, I'm going through for the second time in my life chemotherapy, and believe me, if any of you have been through it, you know it's not a pleasant experience, and it does rob you of a lot of energy, so I'm just gonna sit uh, rather than try to walk around. Uh, but even though I have chemotherapy, I'm a Zaverian brother. I march on, all right? I am teaching and working, and on the days when the chemotherapy is really bad and I can't get to school, I teach my class by Skype, all right? I sit in my bedroom in the brother's house and yell at them over the airwaves. <laughs> so, <coughs> okay. <coughs> Okay, oh my word. I've decided to do a quasi-history of the congregation by looking at some of the men who have lived their lives as Severian brothers. I have divided these men into categories. Now please understand that if you show the handout I will give you to any Severian brother, he would probably quibble with the brothers uh, that I have chosen for each category. Part of our charism as Severian brothers is that we quibble. I think it's because we're a largely Irish community. We like to fight with each other. The categories I have cho chosen are the legends, those early brothers who set, the, set us on a firm foundation. Then the scholars and the thinkers, those brothers who helped mold and shape us by their scholarly work and by their thought. Thirdly, the advocates of the poor and the marginalized. Four, the saints those brothers whom most Zaverian brothers would recognize as some of our great saints. Five, the novice masters, the men who formed us spiritually into what we have come, come to, into what we have become from the beginning. The missionaries, those who never forgot we were founded as a missionary congregation. And finally, my favorite category, the sloggers. The men who just did their job every day, some of them for 40 and 50 years, and who died with their boots on. We have many of them. <clears throat> As I begin with the legends, I'd like to quote the Jesuit uh, theologian Henri de Lubac. The church is no exclusive club for spiritual geniuses or supermen, no academy for the clever. In fact, she is the very opposite. The warped, the shammed, the wretched of every kind crowd together into her, together with the whole host of the mediocre, who feel especially at home in her, and everywhere set the tone of things. But there is no private Christianity, and if we are to accept the church, we must take her as she is in her human day-to-day -day reality, just as much as in her divine and eternal reality. For separation of the two is impossible. We have to push to, to a conclusion the logic of the incarnation by which the divine adapts himself to human weakness. I doubt that Father de Lubac had the Zaverian brothers in mind when he wrote, but I must admit that it fits perfectly. Our holy founder, Theodore Riken, was a man of tremendous faith, but he was also very human, with all the flaws and starts that come with humanity. Both his faith and his humanity were gifts to the Zaverian brothers. Over the years, I have talked to the alumni from our two oldest schools, both of which I've had the, uh, the privilege to head, St. X and Mount St. Joseph. <clears throat> and I've heard over and over again how down to earth and how human the brothers were. 
the alumni look at us as people they could talk to. Okay, we could inspire fear when we had to. Uh, we could bring order out of chaos by one good yell or one good uh, smack, uh, which we, we did do, okay? But on the day-to-day -day level, we related the, with the kids in a very human way. And while the boys may have feared us on occasions, they always respected us and they trusted and loved us because we were so down to earth. I think it's because Riken trained us in a way to be human. As I understand it, you've read Brother Albert's March on God Will Provide, which is a condensed version of Brother Albert's much longer The Life and <coughs> Letters of Theodore Riken. I'd like to begin my discussion of Riken by quoting the opening lines of Life and Letters. This is the story of the persistent, plotting Theodore James Riken, who in 1839 brought into being the congregation of the Brothers of St. Francis Xavier. In founding this brotherhood, which now more than a century later conducts schools in Belgium, England, the United States, the Belgian Congo, and British East Africa, Mr. Riken undertook what practical and experienced men assured him was a preposterous task. Admittedly, the facts were against him. He was 40, his formal education meager, his financial means negligible, his well-placed friends non-existent. To all appearances, he was just one more visionary. To the amazement of everyone, except perhaps himself, he succeeded not only in founding the Brotherhood, but also keeping it alive for day, from day to day for 20 years until he was removed from office and demoted to the ranks. From the natural point of view, this is the story of persistent plotting. From the supernatural point of view, it is the story of one man's faith in the providence of God. And of course, we always look at things from the supernatural point of view. Uh, I have an entire talk on Riken's life, but that takes an hour and we wouldn't get past Riken. <clears throat> I would just like to touch on a few themes in the life of Riken. As you know, he struggled for a number of years to bring our congregation to existence. He had two Jesuit advisors who, who helped him, Father van der Kerkhoef and Father van Beek. Ultimately, however, Riken was left to found us very much on his own. He had tremendous faith that God was calling him to found a lay group of religious, and he plodded along until he brought the Zaverian brothers into existence in 1839. Along the way, he irritated a number of bishops and other religious, particularly the St. Louis Jesuits, he could be brash, but he had incredible confidence in God's providence. Once he founded the congregation in utter poverty, it took a year before he recruited his first disciple, who actually died as a Severian brother. Riken borrowed money, which he never repaid, uh, so that we could have a respectable mother house at Wallinger and Bruges. He coaxed and cajoled numerous people so that he could have his young brothers as educated as possible, and then he sent them off to do great things. First, he brought them to England, where they not only had to learn the language, but also had to teach classes of 100 boys apiece. When he had brothers sufficiently fluent in English, he sent them off to Louisville, Kentucky, to found a German-speaking school and uh, an English-speaking school for the Irish. He quarreled with Archbishop Spalding about salaries. The Archbishop did not have a very high opinion of Riken. <clears throat> but look at what Riken accomplished between 1839 and 1854. He had educated his young brothers, founded schools, sent brothers off as missionaries. This from a man who had precious little education, although he was quite intelligent. I think this is where Riken's humanity comes into play. <clears throat> he was a typical father. He loved and cared for his sons and raised them to be good and zealous religious. Unfortunately, once they had grown up and become those zealous religious, Riken couldn't let go. I think that all the problems which occurred uh, before Riken's forced resignation can be explained as a dysfunctional family. The boys had grown up and Riken wasn't ready to admit that or see that. They had experience that he didn't have even though he was the one who provided them with those experiences. Some of them felt he was holding the congregation back and complained to the bishop who conducted a canonical investigation. After that investigation, Riken was demoted to the ranks. This was very difficult for him, and it took him a while before he could reconcile himself to it. 
Nonetheless, it was his faith that brought us into existence. It was his faith that kept us going when we should have been bankrupt. It was his faith that formed zealous missionaries. It was his faith that sent brothers to strange lands to do great works. One of my favorite sayings of Theodore Riken is, the ways of God's providence are often inscrutable, but always adorable. And the fundamental principles, it's watered down, to my view, to, oh God, I cannot understand your ways, but I must, I must adore them. I like inscrutability, all right? That's a good word, all right? Uh, <clears throat> the inscrutability of God's ways. Riken encountered them, but he learned, even in the inscrutability, uh, to adore them. The fi <clears throat> that faith, Riken's faith, is the foundation stone of the Zverian brothers. And I have seen it over my 45 years in the congregation in countless brothers. Even in some of our most cynical brothers, Riken's faith is still there at, at bedrock. I think from the day we entered, we came to understand that. March on, God will provide. Uh, the faith in God, the inscrutability of God. We can't figure God out. It's not our job. But we have to adore. That's from Riken. Okay, Riken had two go-to guys uh, that, he, that worked with him as he founded the congregation, Brother Vincent Ter Hoven and Brother Paul Van Gerwen. Brother Vincent became the second general and was very significant in his own way. But I would like to talk about Brother Paul Van Gerwen, who I feel has never received the credit that he deserves. When we were novices, we had to memorize catechism questions about the congregation. The first two questions were, who founded the congregation? Oh, well, that's easy, Theodore Riken. The second question was, who was the savior of the congregation? And the answer to that question was Brother Paul Van Gerwen. In the days when it appeared that the Zverian brothers would go bankrupt and be suppressed by the bishop, Brother Paul sent every dime he could collect from Louisville back to Belgium to stave off financial ruin. The brothers in the United States were on very short rations in those days as Brother Paul strove mightily to ensure the future of the congregation. He told the brothers in Louisville that he dreaded opening every letter from Belgium for fear it would tell him that all was at an end and the congregation was suppressed. Sent as leader of the first band of Zverians to Louisville, he was recalled to Belgium four years later. <clears throat> when Brother Vincent became Superior General, he reassigned Brother Paul as head of the second band who went back to Louisville uh, to join Brother Francis and Brother Stephen, who were the brothers who remained in Louisville when the uh, other four were called back. How Brother Paul felt about returning to a place where it might seem he had failed before, we don't know. We do know that he founded St. Xavier High School, and for that we should bless his name forever. In 1866, he was with the first group to leave Louisville to head St. Mary's Industrial School in Baltimore, which we had taken over at the assistance of, insistence of Archbishop Spaulding. St. Mary's was a rugged mission because the brothers were not completely in charge, and Brother Paul had to beg even necessities for the boys and the brothers from the board of directors, who, mind you, were all priests. In 1869, he was sent to England to take charge of the struggling Zavarian School in Manchester, He's the guy, I think, who never got a break. He never got a break. He was always sent into the fight. His greatest challenge, however, came <clears throat> after what we Zavarians refer to as the schism of 1871. In Louisville, Brother Peter Alcantara Clyberg was the superior. The Franco-Prussian War was being uh, fought, and Brother Peter was rapidly pro-French in a community that contained many native German brothers. Feeling that they had no voice and no recourse, many of the German brothers left our congregation, cutting in half the size of the community in Louisville. This was an incredibly traumatic time in our history, the repercussions of which were felt 50 years later. Brother Vincent immediately sent Brother Paul back to Louisville, knowing that the very mention of his name would bring courage to the remaining faint-hearted brothers in Louisville. Brother Julian always refers to Brother Paul as that gentle apostle of charity. And he proved that when he returned to Louisville. He calmed the waters. He sent Brother Stephen to reclaim Brother Hubert, the only one of the schismatic brothers who actually returned to us. He then began slowly to rebuild the community and to bring back stability to the brothers in Louisville. Brother Isidore, who was an eyewitness to this schism, writes about it in his Serenian of Brother Paul. Brother Paul died in 1885. He had signed the diplomas for St. X, and they were on his desk. He was found dead in the morning. As Brother Isidore lamented, 
He died without a brother near him. He died without the sacraments. A brother Paul, Brother Julian wrote, to this day the older alumni of St. Acts refer to Brother Paul as good Brother Paul or that grand man, Brother Paul. They speak of him to their children's children and still he teaches. The large classes of St. Xavier today, this would be 1930, may be traced to Brother Paul's undying influence on the great saint of Carmel, St. Therese, though the first to express it is not the only one of God's servants spending heaven doing good on earth. Brother Paul was the savior of the congregation and the founder of Zaverian education in the United States. He is a man who did everything with God and nothing without God. Brother Dominic, the next of the legends, was a man of tremendous heart, passionately dedicated to the poor, poor and homeless boys. To him, we owe much of our dedication to child care during the late 18th and early 20th centuries. He loved the poor and the homeless so much that he founded a number of child care institutions, many of which did not long survive him. But his heart was always in the right place, and the brothers knew that. Born in Ireland, Brother Dominic came to the United States and entered in Louisville. In 1876, he was assigned as the first superior and principal of Mount St. Joseph and the first canonical novice master as we tried to establish uh, a normal, normally functioning novitiate in the United States. <coughs> Brother Dominic actually had his blood brother, Brother Lawrence, as a novice. <coughs> Brother Dominic, after his years at the Mount, was sent to St. Patrick's School in Lowell. And speaking of Brother Joseph Sullivan, who uh, preceded Brother uh, uh, Dominic at, uh, in Lowell. Brother Julian said, Brother Joseph had tough boys in Louisville, tougher boys in Baltimore, but the toughest were the Irish boys in Lowell. <laughs> they were all Irish immigrants, and they were tough when Brother Dominic took over. Again, he was a man of tremendous heart, and he realized how hard the brothers had to work to tame these Irish boys in classes that could have 70 and 80 kids. Now remember, it's grammar school. Our brothers are teaching them to read and write and count uh, in those days. It wasn't uh, high-level, sophisticated education. To give his brothers some respite during the summer without permission of the provincial, Brother Dominic hired a cottage at a lake so that the brothers could have some rest. The brothers were out in a boat, and somehow the boat overturned. If you know the Zaverian brothers, you can imagine how the boat overturned. <laughs> Only one, only one, Brother Bonaventure, could swim. He secured his confreres to the overturned boat and then swam for help. He never made it. He drowned on the way. Brother Alexis held Brother Dominic responsible for Brother Bonaventure's death and removed him as superior in Lowell and sent him to St. Mary's Industrial School as a teacher. Again, the providence of God was at work. Cardinal Gibbons was visiting St. Mary's one day, and with the insight he had into the character of men, he said to Brother Alexis, Brother Dominic needs to be in charge here. Well, Brother Alexis couldn't quibble with the, the bishop, and so Brother Dominic was placed in charge. He remained there for the rest of his life, transforming the institution and making it as homey as he could. He took the boys out of uniform and encouraged the brothers to be as good to the kids as they could be, given how tough the kids were. When Brother Alexis died, Brother Dominic was appointed provincial on the suggestion of the perpetually professed brothers. They always knew that Brother Dominic was not at fault in the death of Brother Bonaventure. They all knew it was Brother Dominic's great heart which had got him, got him into difficulty. Unfortunately, Cardinal Gibbons insisted that he remain director of St. Mary's as he was provincial. Brother Julian says that no brother was ever afraid of Brother Dominic. And for a provincial and the Zavarian brothers, that's saying a great deal. He encouraged all of the superiors to take good care of the brothers and he encouraged the brothers to take good care of the boys. He was a man who ruled by love and not by fear, who won the hearts of boys by love and not by fear. His heart is his gift to the Zaverian brothers, and I think that Brother Dominic's heart is very much a part of who we are and how we relate to kids. When he died, all 900 boys at St. Mary's attended the funeral. All 900 returned to the school after the burial. In those days, a St. Mary's kid would run whenever he had the chance. The brothers took it as a tremendous tribute to Brother Dominic that they all came back. No one ran. Brother Isidore is perhaps the most influential brother in our history. I always say that he is the brother at the very mention of whose name every Zaverian brother should bow his head in reverence. I was once at Zaverian House in uh, Louisville when I was uh, president there. 
Let me just take a drink here. <clears throat> and Brother Peter Walsh was putting up a picture of Brother Isidore in the dining room. One brother asked him who that was. When he said Brother Isidore, the brother replied, who in hell is Brother Isidore? At that point, all of the brothers in the dining room let out a howl, and Brother Peter turned to the brother and said, you have to be the stupidest damn Severian brother that ever lived. <laughs> and I, actually, he was. <laughs> we'll mention no names. <clears throat> Everybody knows who Brother Isidore is and the debt we owe to Brother Isidore. You heard Brother Isidore's name the night you went to the Zaverian Brothers. You, I'm, I'm convinced Brother Kevin said something about Brother Isidore on the, the night we entered. Uh, <clears throat> okay, fine, where I am. Okay, if we are a well-educated community today, it is because of Brother Isidore and Brother James. I will treat Brother James very briefly. He was an incredible schoolman and led St. X for about 32 years when he was assigned to Mount St. Joseph, where he died after six years. He demanded nothing but the best from the brothers and the boys. He turned St. X during his years as headmaster into a de facto scholasticate, insisting that the young brothers educate themselves even when formal education was not available to them. He and Brother Isidore were of one mind and one heart on the education of the community. They were both candidates for provincial in 1907. As Brother Albert wrote in his Serenian on Brother Isidore, these two gentlemen were the antithesis of each other. Brother James was a commanding figure, Brother Isidore undistinguished in appearance. Brother James took to oratory on the slightest provocation, Brother Isidore on very rare occasions. Brother James would have relied on his magic voice to master an angry mob. Brother Isidore would have resorted to sneezing powder. Brother James was the hidebound traditionalist. Brother Isidore was the gambling experimenter. Brother James was always Brother James. Brother Isidore was just Isidore. Brother James ruled, Brother Isidore led. Brother James and Brother Isidore were not rivals. They had a sincere, sincere mutual admiration for each other. They were Severian brothers, first, last, and always. Born in Germany and completely self-educated, Brother Isidore <coughs> became the prefect of studies at St. X and then at Mount St. Joseph. At the Mount, <coughs> during the reign of Brother Joseph Sullivan as superior, Brother Isidore ran the school in the days when it was a boarding school. He taught many of the classes, organized the board of sports and games, dammed the creek so they'd have a place to swim, and told them the stories at night to help get them to sleep. He was the heart and soul of the Mount in those days. He was immediately appointed superior of the Mount when Brother Joseph died, which he governed until he was elected in 1907. At his inauguration as provincial, he said that his primary concern would be the education of the brothers. <clears throat> Once years ago, after, uh, or years ago, after a brother of the Christian schools had given a magnificent talk, one Zaverian brother commented, what Zaverian brother could ever do that? Brother Isidore was ashamed, and he was determined that he ever had the chance. He would change that and make Zaverian brothers a well-educated community. For the years of his provincialate, from 1907 until 1925, he did just that. He sent brothers and aspirants to Harvard Summer School, where they all washed out very quickly because they did not have proper preparation. He began to give brothers proper preparation and sent numbers off to Catholic University for degrees. He encouraged summer study at the Mount when the Mount was an accredited college. And he sent brothers to other colleges in places where they were. He took a ragtag group of men and turned them into a well-educated community. In the years immediately after Brother Isidore left office, that would have been 1925, we opened a number of high schools, Mission High School, John Baptist High School, Malden Catholic High School, St. Michael's, Diocesan High School, and Keith Academy. We could only do that because we had degreed brothers who could teach in these schools. We had degreed brothers uh, because Brother Isidore moved heaven and earth to make sure we became educated. Now, if you remember, Brother Isidore was a German, and he was present at the Great Schism of 1871, which hurt him deeply uh, because many of his friends left the community. When World War I broke out and we started fighting the Germans, there were still many native German brothers in the American province of the Severian brothers. Brother Isidore was terrified uh, that uh, some loose talk, anti-German talk on the part of uh, the brothers would, would reenact the system of 1871. So on the opening day of the war, he put the entire 
community under obedience that they could not talk about the war. The war went on, we Severian brothers ignored it. Uh, brother Aubert, who was a young brother at the time, said that the brothers obeyed to a man. They knew that Brother Isidore loved the United States, but they also knew how deeply the schism of 1871 had hurt him, and they would do nothing to hurt Brother Isidore again. Brother Isidore was also the great apostle of Esprit de Corps. He established the Zaverian, Zaveriana, so brothers would know <coughs> where their friends were missioned. He started sending brothers to Europe to work so that we would know that we are not just the American Zaverian brothers, we are part of a great international body. He loved his brothers, they knew it, and they loved him. The late Bonnie von Paris, who graduated from Mount St. Joseph in 1932, once told me about Brother Isidore's funeral. I was dumbfounded. I said, you were at Brother Isidore's funeral? He says, yes, it was a couple years after I graduated. He was such a man and so much a part of the school uh, that I didn't want to miss it. That from a graduate uh, about an occasion that was, took place 70 years before. At the end of his Serenian, Brother Aubert, who was one of those aspirants sent to Harvard in 1908, writes, Brother Isidore has passed on. We shall never, in the ordinary course of events, see his like again. In the congregation, he lived, moved, and had his being. To us, his spiritual children, he left a rich legacy. From some place in the Valhalla, he loved that word, of the Zaverian dead, he still declaims, to you from falling hands I throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. Well, that wraps up the legends, and now we move on to the scholars and the thinkers. My choice for scholars and thinkers are Brother Robert Downey, Brother Thomas Moore Page, Brother Philip Doherty, Brother Jeremiah Dromey, and Brother Joseph Gerard Tian, who was, is responsible for my being a Zaverian brother today. I would like to talk about Brother Robert because he was my teacher. At the novitiate at Newton Highlands, Brother Robert taught the junior novices English and the junior and senior novices the history of the congregation. He was a masterful teacher and an incredibly scholarly man. We were locked away in the novitiate where we had very little contact with the outside world and no newspapers. Albert quickly learned what each one of us liked and he would bring in clippings from the papers about things that would interest us. He had us write a composition every day which he corrected minutely and he gave us one of the only breaks in our day. We all looked forward to our hour with Brother Albert. In terms of the history of the congregation, he taught that to us once a week for an hour and a half. He was the first brother sent to research the life of the founder. He was given time off to do it, and the product was the life and letters of Theodore Riken, which is condensed into March On, God Will Provide. Brother Jan Devada wrote the definitive life of Riken and said that Aubert did a masterful work with very poor translations. What Aubert did that Jan Devada didn't do was to uh, write a readable book. Jan Devada also took Riken as a historical figure and not as a man of faith who founded a religious congregation. Aubert never lost sight of the fact that he was writing about a man with incredible faith who did wonderful things for God, <clears throat> whom he loved dearly, and to whose service he had devoted his life. Not to denigrate Jan Devada, but Jan Devada forgot what he was doing. Jan Devada wrote a history, uh, a pure history of our founder, with no faith perspective. I thought it was the oddest thing for a religious ever to do, uh, but it gave us a great deal of factual information about our founder that we didn't have. Brother Ovid loved the novices and he said he wanted to inspire us by telling us the stories of the valiant men who would come before us and on whose shoulders we rest. His stories were always tinged with humor. He wrote the original monology, The Lives of the Brothers Who Had Died in the Congregation, and it was so human that two brothers uh, who were among the powers that be had it suppressed because they thought it was just too human. Goes back to Riken. Brother Aubert was a man who knew who we were. Uh, and when he did the monology of, of the brothers, he built in the fact that we're, we're not plaster saints. We're pretty human guys. Well, <clears throat> Brother Ricardo and Brother Jason uh, thought that that was uh, unbecoming. So it was suppressed. Uh, when Brother Thomas Ryan and I took over the monology, we restored Brother Aubert's original uh, translation with all of its wonderful prose, some of which you will read in the handout I will give you. At that time, Brother Jason was dead and Brother Ricardo was senile, so we thought we were in pretty good <laughs> shape. You will also read about the beautiful friendship between Brother Aubert and Brother Peter Celestin. 
Brother Avret, well-educated, a scholar, headmaster of St. John's Prep, principal of Keith Academy, director of the Working Boys Home, provincial counselor, general counselor, writer of the first biography uh, of Riken, scholarly man. But he had as his trusty sidekick, Brother Peter Celestin, an uneducated man who never taught beyond the fourth grade. The bond between the two of them was the most beautiful expression of Zverian fraternity I have ever witnessed. <coughs> All of the novices obviously noticed it as well. Every night we watched Aubert, Peter, and Peter's dog Cindy go for their evening walk. You would think that the two such different men would have nothing to talk about, <clears throat> but they did. Talk they did. Actually, Brother Peter did most of the talking, <clears throat> playing Gracie Allen to Brother Aubert's George Burns. Aubert, it's hard to, uh, when you think of, of people like Phil Doherty, who, you know, did a lot of incredible thinking, and Thomas More. Uh, Aubert was cut from a different bolt of cloth. He was an older man, but still just so incredibly scholarly that he's, he's impressed me. I've been in the congregation 45 years, uh, and I always think of him as what I might want to be if I set about to do real serious academic work. Okay, and that brings me to the advocates for the poor and the marginalized, and for those brothers, uh, I've chosen Brother Peter Celestin, Brother Peter Julian, Brother Gregory Turlick, and Brother Peter Kelly. Now, some of you, I expect, think I'm going to talk about Peter Kelly, but I'm not. I'm going to talk about Peter Celestin and Peter Julian. Because Brother Dominic had such a heart for the poor and homeless, he opened a number of child care institutions, and of course, he himself ran St. Mary's between 1866 uh, uh, and 19... Excuse me, we ran St. Mary's. Between 1866 and 1965, many Zavarian brothers devoted their lives to our child care institutions. St. Mary's Industrial School, the Working Boys Home, Mount Loretto, Staten Island, and the CYO Home in Detroit. Our two primary child care institutions were St. Mary's and the Working Boys Home. <clears throat> they were very different institutions. St. Mary's had 900 boys, many of whom were delinquents. The Working Boys Home had only 60 or 70. The Working Boys' Home was a very homey place. Brother Fabian Lyons had been the superior of the home for many, many years because Cardinal O'Connell realized he was the man that the home needed, and every time his term was up, Cardinal O'Connell went to Rome and got a dispensation. Brother Fabian gathered around him a group of brothers, many of whom had tuberculosis or other illnesses because the Working Boys' Home was considered like duty. I always remember Brother Peter Julian talking about how he would carry Brother Felix Riley, long gone with tuberculosis, down to the playing field so that Brother Felix could coach from his chair his football team. Brother Felix at that time weighed 70 pounds, and he was dying, but every day Brother, Robert, uh, Brother Peter Julian carried him down to Hibernian Field and he coached. That's a Zaverian brother. The boys at the home loved the place. My good friend Brother Giles was sent to the home as a 10-year-old boy when his mother died and his father could not take care of the family. Four years later, Giles went to the junior eight for high school to begin training to become a brother. He said to me once, I had lost one family and found another in the brothers. I wasn't about to lose them, so I joined up. 62 years later, he's still here, and he'll tell you stories about the home. Stories about men like Brother Ackwood Cronin, who was almost completely deaf, but how, who somehow had a way of just winning the hearts of the boys. We've had two or three generations of brothers who devoted their whole lives to child care. Brother Peter Selston was one of them. He spent many years at St. Mary's. We had Brother Thomas Moore as a student and at the Working Boys Home. Brother Peter was among the simplest of men. I've already talked about him. But he had an incredibly loving heart. Of his days at St. Mary's Industrial School, Brother Thomas Moore wrote, The brother who had the greatest influence on me at St. Mary's was Brother Peter Celestin, known to us all simply as Brother Pete. When he became prefect of the number four dormitory, discipline and rigidity gave way to gentleness and concern. The dormitory at night was a lively place with the radio on, card games, and good-natured roughhousing. Pete's great gift was that he could make you feel happy. For us kids, it was a priceless gift. Without being a psychologist, Pete knew that you could tell a child anything, that you could open up for a child the wonder of life and the vagaries of the human psyche. And in opening up that world, he could make the child have a sense of his own dignity. Peter dedicated his life to the poor and homeless boys and did for all of them what he did for Brother Thomas More. 
He was so proud when Thomas Wool was named Superior General and invited him to Rome to meet the Pope. When the working boys' home closed and became St. Joseph Novitiate, Brother Peter stayed on as the procurator. He was a dreadful cook, but all, we all loved him, and we smiled when he served donuts that could have doubled as boat anchors, <coughs> or his famous St. Patrick's Day cake that made us all poop green for a week. <laughs> he did for the novices what he did for the poor and homeless boys. He made us feel at home. And you have to remember, in those days, we were probably all pretty homesick. One night, his dog Cindy, who was terrified of thunder, broke through a number of locked doors and ended up on top of me in the second floor dormitory because mine was the first cubicle. <clears throat> it was during the grand silence, so we weren't supposed to talk, but I had this terrified, slobbering dog on top of me. I led her back to the kitchen where Brother Peter was beginning bre breakfast. Since we weren't supposed to talk, I tried to signal to Brother Peter what had happened, and he said, for God's sake, brother, we don't take the grand silence that seriously. Where was Cindy? <laughs> she was on my bed, brother. When I was first assigned to St. John's High School in Shrewsbury, I lived with another one of the home brothers, Brother Peter Julian. He was a gruffer, tougher man, and it was written of him. His contemporaries remember how vividly at St. Mary's Industrial School, uh, vividly the splendid rapport he had in the tradition of Brother Matthias with the larger, tougher boys. It was not just that they were in awe of his physical strength and athletic prowess, but they knew in him they had a friend, a mentor, and a true brother. But God help you if you were a young junior professed brother in Brother Peter's community and you somehow messed up some of his groundskeeping equipment. He, was, he could let you know what he thought. These men are as much as part of our history as the scholarly teaches. In fact, given our definition at the 1995 chapter that we were to be men for the poor and marginalized, they were doing the work long before we ever named it. And that brings me to the saints. I think the men I have picked as our saints, are the men I've picked as our saints, Brother Ivan, Brother Philip Neary, Brother Plunkett, Brother Dennis Flynn, and Brother Harold Boyle, are men who most brothers would recognize as among our great saints. It was my great privilege to live on my first mission, St. John's High School, with Brother Philip Neary. He was a brilliant man and a masterful teacher, a handyman who could do carpentry and electrical work around the school, and with his dear friend, Brother Plunkett, refurbished the old mansion in Windsor, Vermont that we used for a while as a second division. As a young brother, I carried Brother Philip's tools. Together, we were lined a boiler in the gymnasium of St. John's High School. Actually, Brother Philip <coughs> relined it by having me crawl into the boiler and then telling me where to put the bricks. Given the fact that I'm a tad claustrophobic, I was very happy that Brother Phil worked quickly. He taught me how to change ballasts, how to fix lockers, <coughs> but he could never teach me how to paint. Uh, I was too much of a klutz. Brother Philip rose every morning at 4 o'clock. He turned on the heat, unlocked the school, melted the, mil melt the milkman as he came to deliver the milk for the cafeteria, and made sure that the school was ready for the boys to, the to arrive. He then went to the chapel where he spent an hour in adoration before the west rest of us got up to come in to say the morning office and go to Mass. Phil then went to his classroom where he did a masterful job teaching math and science. He and I taught the same class one year. I could barely control them. And as they left me, I watched them walk through the dividing door between the classroom. And as they walked through, I could see them calm down uh, as they went into Brother Philip. Brother Philip uh, had learned long ago that boys need structure. Oh, I've lost myself here. Uh, as soon as they came into his classroom, 10 boys put the homework on the board while the rest of them did seat work for the problems that Brother Phil had put on the board. He then reviewed homework, taught the new concept, practiced the new concept, and assigned the homework. The moment he stopped assigning the homework, the bell rang, and off the boys went. I was in awe of it and asked him if I would ever get to the point where I could control a class the way he did. He smiled and said, give it time, it'll come, and it did. I still use the grading system that Philip Neary gave me, and I follow his dictum that the more grades a boy has, the better he will do. Brother Ivan had the same dictum. As soon as school was over, Phil would doff his habit, put on his work clothes, and begin whatever project he was working on. And then there was another hour of adoration before he would come in, we would come in to say the evening office. In the evening, Phil either worked or prepared his classes. He had been teaching for 40 or 45 years when I knew him, but he always did every problem that he assigned to the boys, even though he had done them a thousand times. 
And they were boys to Phil. The kids were always the boys. He referred to them as the boys, and it was always said with incredible affection. I once remember when Phil and I were working in the gym, a young coach was berating his team. And Phil turned to me, I think feeling he had to give the young brother instruction. And he said, we never treat the boys like that, never. The coach disappeared shortly, and I'm sure it was because Brother Philip went to Brother Connell, the headmaster, and told him what he had seen. Brother Philip Neary was an old time Zavarian brother. He kept his religious name, and he always wore the habit. He retired from the classroom when he was 75, and he continued to work on his many projects until old age forced him to cut back. As a final gesture, scientist that he was, he gave his body to science. Since there was no corpse at the funeral, the brothers wondered how they could symbolize Phil. It was very simple. One of the brothers carried in his habit at the beginning of Mass. There wasn't a dry eye in the house. We talk about the virtues of Zaverian education, humility, simplicity, trust, zeal, and compassion. While all of those are very important, I think we left out one of the most important and one of the virtues that I think is just quintessential to the Zaverian brothers, fidelity. In my experience, it has been one of the chief characteristics of the Zaverian brothers. Brother Philip was a faithful man. Brother Philip entered the brothers on the 17th of September in 1932. He took his first vows in 1903. 1933, and then for 65 years, he kept those vows. In those 65 years, he loved God, he loved his brothers, and he loved the thousands of boys whom God had entrusted to his care. He was a faithful man and one of our great saints. That brings me to the novice masters. This is going to be controversial. We have discovered recently in Africa that if you don't have a good novice master, you're going to have problems. The training of young religious in a religious order is of paramount importance. From 1917 to 1961, the American province of the Zuri Brothers had only three novice masters, Brother Julian Ryan, Brother Urban Kelly, and Brother Kevin Kenny. With the exception of Brother Larry uh, and a couple of others who entered after the Golden Age, most of the brothers in the room today were trained by Brother Kevin. Uh, between the American province and the St. Joseph province, he was novice master for 25 years. On the day of his death, he had trained over half of the living community, actually 51%, and much of the community that was already with God. <clears throat> of the hundreds of novices he trained, you will probably get as many different views on Brother Kevin. Brother Giles hated him. I loved him. He was a child of his time, and he trained us in a very traditional view of religious life, pounding into our heads the essential of prayer, spiritual reading, and zeal. He would say to us, start praying for the boys you're going to have in class one day. They've already been born. If we had quirks, which he thought might cause problems later on in the classroom, he tried to correct them. For example, I walk with my toes pointed out like a duck. Brother Kevin would repeatedly say to me, Brother Owen, get those feet in. The boys will make fun of you. I could never rearrange the way I walked. And of course, over the years, the boys have made fun of it. Brother Kevin did insist that we get out of the rarefied atmosphere of the novitiate at least once a week, and he did that by going to, we did that by going to visit the sick. He also insisted that be, we be bled by the Red Cross every six weeks. <laughs> On one occasion, I had a temperature of 101 and told Brother Kevin I couldn't go to give blood. He said, told me that I had to go anyway. On a hot summer's day, dressed in a black suit with a black top hat, I walked in a mile and a half to be rejected because I had a temperature. When I returned to the division, I told Brother Kevin that they had rejected me, and he said, oh, those nurses don't understand our life. I never understood what that meant. <laughs> One of our classmates walked around on a broken leg, a leg for three days before Brother Kevin let him go to the doctors. Despite his quirks and despite the fact that he had been condem condemned to live his life with teenagers, uh, he did the job faithfully according to his lights. Only years after he died, when I was rooting through the General Aid archives, I discovered a set of correspondence between Brother Kevin and Brother Ambrose, who was then the Superior General. Apparently, Brother Kevin had a terrible case of scrupulosity, and he felt he was doing great damage to the novices because he was not properly trained to be a novice master. Kevin's letters to Ambrose were hard to read because of the anguish Kevin was experiencing, something I'm sure his novices never saw. Ambrose, being the good old-fashioned superior general, wrote back and told Kevin he had been assigned in obedience to be the novice master and novice master he would remain, and that he was to do his job to the best of his ability. Again, Kevin would write in anguish, and again, Ambrose would tell him to buck up. Reading that correspondence gave me an entirely different view of my novice master. 
I began to see him as an incredibly heroic man who was in many ways a martyr to an old-fashioned sense of obedience. He was condemned for 25 years to live with teenagers and to try to turn them into Severian brothers. That he succeeded is beyond doubt. He was novice master for, at this point, uh, I think four superiors general, and of the living American community today in the United States, with the exception of a couple of the real old guys like Bede and then uh, a few of the younger ones, uh, the entire community was, and those, except for those who had Brother Placidus, almost the entire community was trained by Brother Kevin. Again, fidelity was the cornerstone of his life. Fidelity even in the face of anguish and scruples. One last story. One night when I was principal of Xavier High School, I had attended a board meeting at Malden Catholic. I was very tired and dreading the two-hour drive back to Connecticut at 10 o'clock at night. I went into the community room at MC to get a soda to perk me up, and I ran into Brother Kevin, who was there counseling freshmen and doing a wonderful job. He said, you look tired. Come give your old novice master a hug. I told him that if he saw me hugging another brother when I was a novice, he would have sent me home. To this he replied, I've had a new insight in my old age. You are very important to the congregation, and you need to take care of yourself. Now give me a hug. I left Malden Catholic that night far less tired than before my encounter with Brother Kevin. I'm going to skip the missionaries because I want to get to the sloggers. The sloggers are those who just went on and did their job, not looking for any praise or any thanks. <clears throat> of the late Brother Clement Foley, Brother Albert wrote, he went off to the wars promptly like everybody else in those primitive days. For 49 years, he was just another GI, slogging along in the mud and carrying out his infinitesimal part in the great effort. That's Albert's prose. So many of our brothers were sloggers. My favorite was Brother Miles McManus, whom we always called Coach. Miles had a somewhat troubled life and a serious bout with alcoholism. He found his salvation in AA, and from that time he attended his first meeting until the day he died. He was faithful, as faithful to AA as he was to his brothers. <clears throat> but he was quirky. He was a quirky man. Uh, he did the circuit in those days. He was at Our Lady of Good Counsel Annex, Cardinal Hayes, Holy Cross, St. Teresa's, Working Boys Home, Archbishop Stavonac, St. Joseph's Lower Dell, John Baptist, Notre Dame, Malden Catholic, and Xavier. Now, if you had a lot of missions uh, as a Xavierian brother, you were either incredibly talented or a pain in the ass. Uh, Miles, unfortunately, was a pain in the ass. Uh, if you see a dead brother and you see 20 missions, uh, you know something was up, because we usually stayed a little bit longer. Uh, <clears throat> Brother Miles worked as a teacher on the Xavier faculty when I was the principal. One night I was wandering the school during PTA, and I saw Miles in his classroom sitting in a circle with 12 guys. I called him out and said, Coach, what the hell is going on? He replied, oh, these kids, uh, these are the founders of the kids who are in AA with me. They didn't know I was a brother, because you know it's anonymous. We're having an AA meeting. <laughs> I said, Coach, you can't have an AA meeting. It's PTA. You have to talk to the parents. He said, oh, I only teach the smart boys, and they get good grades. The parents don't want to see me. That was Coach. He loved the kids whom he taught and coached. Uh, you can just ask Larry Harvey about that, because he was one of them whom Coach taught and coached. <clears throat> During Coach's drinking days, the kids would actually cover for him because they liked him so much. Uh, they knew that he was going to get in trouble if the... Uh, Brother Robertus or whoever caught him. Uh, and so the kids, the kids would actually sort of surround Coach so that nobody could see him. Coach was a slogger. He worked until he died. He was in the classroom well over 40 years. And when he left Xavier, he returned to Malden Catholic where he did counseling until he became sick. He was just another GI who slogged it out in the mud doing his infinitesimal part in a great effort. As I give you this stroll down Zaverian Lane, I hope it gives you a sense of who we are as a group of religious men. We are doing a lot of studying about our charism and what that means, and I'm delighted with the work that uh, Brother Reggie Cruz is doing on our founder and our charism. But I hope that our congregation never loses sight of the fact that our charism is best seen in the brothers who have lived the life faithfully for a lifetime. When I came out of formation and was missioned at St. John's High School, I learned what it meant to be a Zaverian brother from Brother Ivan Corkery and Brother Philip Neary. When I was sent to Xavier High School, I learned what it means to be a Zaverian brother, brother by watching Brother Jeremiah Dromey, Brother John Elliott, and Brother Michelangelo Abernethy.
At St. X, I learned what it means to be his Varian brother by watching Borgia, John Wills, and Giles. At the Mount, I've learned what it means to be his Varian brother for Brother Lambert. All of these men incarnated our charism, and all of the men are our history. I'm sorry, I'm very sorry that I had to read that to you. I, I would far prefer to have been uh, more engaging as a speaker, but unfortunately I just can't uh, do that at the moment. Uh, but I hope that what I've said, and I'm going to give you a copy of it, and I'm going to give you some readings as well, uh, give you a sense of who we are as a religious community in our 170 years. Courtney told me that I had to provide you with questions. Well, the questions would be, one, did any of the brothers I mentioned touch your heart? Uh, and why? And the second question would be, of the Zverian brothers you, you know, do you see any of these dynamics at work? All of the men that I've talked about today are obviously dead. I wouldn't talk about living Zverian brothers. That would get me in a great deal of trouble. <laughs> but all of these men are our history. And as Brother uh, Albert wrote about Isidore, to us from falling hands they have passed the torch, which we must hold high. Amen. Thank you.